Hey everyone, this is Victor from Cyborg for Life, and I want to welcome you back to part three of the history of Ilozarov with Dr. Quinn Schrader, where he's going to dive deeper into what Dr. Ilozarov was like as a man and as a surgeon, as well as talk about the athletes and celebrities that he treated that catapulted his career into stardom, thus garnering him worldwide recognition. So, without further ado, enjoy episode three, The Scrap Metal Surgeon, The Celebrity Celebrity, Dr. Ilozarov. Well, first of all, Victor, thanks for having me back on. Uh, hopefully you'll have me on one more time for part four, but th this is part three right now of the Scrap Metal Surgeon. Uh, hopefully everybody's enjoyed it so far. This one's named A Celebrity's Celebrity, and like I said, this is episode three. And I know originally we were trying to do this every two weeks, and you and I are just busy men, and uh, it's been about a month since the last one, but uh, better light than never. So just uh, episode one recap, which we already went over this prior to, so we'll kind of speed through, but we talked about the versatility of bones and just how amazing of a tissue and how moldable of a tissue bones can be. We talked about how uh, Dr. Ilazarov moved around because of war when he was young and became a doctor due to a, a doctor that treated him. And uh, we then moved on to kind of how he moved to Kurgan in this remote area of Russia and gained an interest in orthopedics. We went into the Duga harness and how this kind of led to the inspiration of the, the frame overall that he would popularize and talk about some of his early patients and then starting to reveal some of his work to um, Russia and, and domestically within his country. I actually had a cool video come in shows um, Dr. Lazarov doing the blueprint of his device Wow! and, and the basic shape it took. And uh, it's what we've come to know and familiarize ourselves with. Oh, that's um, so cool. It's very old footage, I believe from the, from the seventies here. All right. Episode two, uh, <clears throat> we talked about people out there doing external fixation even well before Ilzarov and some pretty insane designs, some pretty just insane people overall. We then got into the concept of turnbuckles, which was kind of the layman's term for telescopic rods or what uh, it's an attachment that Ilzarov put onto his device that allowed him to shorten and lengthen um, <clears throat> uh, his device and therefore different extremities. Mm -hmm. And we called it the lefty loose blunder where what he thought he was uh, compressing uh, somebody's bone actually through a, a weird kind of twist of fate and some accidents, the bone actually got stretched. And I actually got another cool video that I think illustrates this pretty well. Mm. And see that with these turnbuckles or these telescopic rods, whatever you want to call them, somebody can turn them and watch how this bone can be distracted. <clears throat> of course, black and white video here, but um, you know, it's part three. We've graduated to some some better videos, wow. so I, I think we learned it. Um, <laughs> this is kind of the concept. And then we got into kind of the history of bone tinkering. We talked about these tribes that will put in metal rings around ladies' necks and actually are changing the shape of their chest and their clavicles and their rib structures. Um, and actually to some pretty sad effects, we talked about foot binding uh, this ancient and even into modern day Chinese practice that they broke the bones and confined the foot and actually bent it to their will. Mm -hmm. um, another one we talked about was head lengthening. You remember kind of the most alien looking skulls uh, that many, many, many different uh, tribes around the world have done in the past. We got into some of the earliest leg lengthening. If you kind of remember this barbaric uh, surgeon who was uh, attaching these people to this device and doing forceful pulls mm -hmm. on the leg and actually getting about three to eight centimeters of lengthening. This was the earliest known form of, of limb lengthening. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the law of tension stress, which is uh, really this concept that Ilzarov worked most of his life towards was developing a rate and a speed on how fast to expand or collapse these bones, how the bone regenerates, and again, putting stress or tension on these bones and how they react. So mm -hmm. this is a little bit of a recap of what we've done in the past two episodes. Mm -hmm. And I have this kind of interesting German painting here I found, which has many of the uh, best well-known orthopedics from the 20th century. And if you look, while most of the leading surgeons are focused uh, kind of towards the middle on this implantable 
device running down uh, the bone. There's one man on the, the far right, uh, Dr. Ilzarov, looking <laughs> away from the center and taking kind of an alternative approach and notice his scrap metal is right there in hand. So it just kind of gives us overall idea of just how different, you know, uh, this, this man thought from mm -hmm. the other lines of his time. Wow. So no matter how hard I try in these videos, Victor, like, I don't think I'll ever be able to give Dr. Ilzarov the praise he really deserves. Mm -hmm. Words and pictures uh, still come up empty for the true mightiness that Ilzara possessed and shared with the world. Never had anyone been able to change someone's body ailments so dramatically and consistently. Ailments once seen as permanent, Dr. Ilzara made permeable. He did not think in a matter of moments or days. His concentrated medical mind understood how to cure someone over vast stretches of time. Mm -hmm. I think this developing girl represents that pretty darn well. Mm -hmm. This wasn't surgery to replace a heart valve or repair a rotator cuff. This was long, exaggerated, tediously involved surgeries that he was doing. And he truly lived in a world of marathons over sprints, for lack of a better term. <clears throat> Simple functions that many of us take for granted, like putting on a sweater, picking up a box off the floor, or walking around the park, others may have never done in their life. And Ilizarov gave many of them the ability to. This is the same man on the left and the right. I think I showed this picture previously. Uh, notice uh, the x-rays down below each picture and what mm -hmm. he was able to do with his frame in order to restore function to mm -hmm. this gentleman. Um, just truly, truly Absolutely. amazing. Again, I think pictures and videos can describe what he was able to do. Yeah. So, into kind of some of the fun celebrity gossip and celebrity uh, gurus who who enjoy this sort of stuff. Uh, back, obviously, this is from the 1960s, but we're going to talk about some of these famous people Ilzarov treated. So, in 1967, he received his first influential client. Gaining friends in high places, the so Soviet Union heartthrob and Olympic gold medalist Valerie Brummel knocked at Ilzarov's door. And we'll get to why in just a minute. But three years earlier, Brummel set a world record at the Olympic Games in Tokyo, Japan. Mm. Thanks to new orbiting satellites and trans-Pacific communication cables, it was the first year the Summer Games were broadcasted internationally. And as many witnessed his high-flying achievements... Brummel soared into stardom. He had kind of this James Dean look to him and his elfish stature and, you know, meaty frog legs helped him perfect what was called the straddle style high jump technique. You can see in that picture right there. Mm -hmm. And this was well before what's known today as the Fosbury flop, which is a more efficient method of jumping popularized by Dick Fosbury, Dick Fosbury and athletes, Nowadays, clear the bar, kind of back arched and belly up. So Brummel was was well before this time. Even though he was a Soviet, he was truly world famous. <clears throat> you might be saying, eh, really a, a high jumper, right? Like a world famous high jumper. But this was an age before football and basketball and soccer were, you know, multi-billion dollar industries. And Olympic athletes were very loved, not only domestically, but the best of them were adored abroad by, you know, countries beyond their own. Mm -hmm. And Brummel was actually so famous that he was on the cover of the American produced magazine, Sports Illustrated, wow. and actually was on there twice, which is, which is pretty cool to think about. And I actually was able to find a copy of it online. I said, I'd bring some show and tell. So oh, this yeah. is the 19, 1963 article and he actually writes it himself and um wow he actually like becomes a writer and stuff but you That's can see crazy. he was very popular and adored um just by everyone uh kind of a, a man's man that way so that's awesome <clears throat> and so just how high could he jump that's Whoa. kind of an important question right about seven foot six inches a world Whoa. record that actually stood for eight years and he was notorious for being able to kick a basketball hoop, which is pretty insane. Yeah. So another way to put his performance in perspective, 
is what could have been maybe like a near clash of the titans. The, the spring-loaded <laughs> Brummel had the vertical finesse to clear the noggin of his contemporary celebrity, Andre the Giant, <laughs> who made his pro wrestling debut right around the same time. So not only could have he cleared the Giant, but would still have room to tighten his uh, drawstrings around his waist. <laughs> so, you know, that never happened. But to give you perspective on just how high this guy could jump. And unfortunately, like James Dean, a vehicular accident kind of became his demise. By the prime age of 23, he'd broken his own record six times already, but an accident the following year splintered any new PR hopes. Mm -hmm. While he was riding on a friend's scooter, he sustained multiple fractures to his right leg when the two-wheeler actually rolled over it and left his leg basically dangling from the tendons. <clears throat> multiple operations still left his leg malaligned and shortened, and not only did his career as an elite athlete fumble, obviously, but his normal routines became memories of, of yesteryear. Mm. The jumper sadly now needed forearm crutches and walking sticks just to mooch a few dozen steps from his porch to a taxi. Wow. Uh, so real sad story. But though ever the young Cracker Jack, Brummel still pushed for solutions that could get him back in the stadium. Mm -hmm. But three years on kind of this medical tour to Russia, so to call it, in and out of the Soviets' best operating rooms, piloted by the greatest surgeons the country could offer, still left him, you know, a crippled man. Mm -hmm. And rather than slog around a, a dying leg with each step, doctors suggested foregoing more surgery and actually offered him an, a definitive amputation. Wow. And Brummel was chafed by this offer and decided to seek you know, further evaluations. And interesting enough, an orthopedic surgeon from Moscow secretly tipped him off about a self-trained surgeon by the name of, you know, you guessed it, Ilzarov. Romo would have to trust Ilzarov's kind of what they call lock style approach that he used for fixing bad fractures like this, but just maybe it could work. And with so many surgeries in Brummel's rear view mirror, the, and really little to show for it, his leg kind of belonged in a secondhand store window, having been really the surgical specimen, uh, kind of the hand-me-down specimen of, of many surgeons. But salvaging his leg at this point would require very unorth unorthodox maneuvers, and roundabout surgery on a chronically crooked leg would require ingeniously crooked and an abstract mind. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> Brummel traded a thousand days of peril for, you know, about a thousand mile plane ticket out of mm -hmm. Moscow. When he arrived to Ilzarov's clinic, he was amazed to find, quote, a strange planet populated by people with iron legs and arms. At his Kurgan destination, he became part of this strange planet. And finally, he received the Ilzarov special, a mm -hmm. frame with the side of true hope and hopefully healing. Wow. Notice the wide pant leg in the far right picture. Notice his right leg oh, yeah. and the pant leg actually going around the frame. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Olympian spent a lot of his next three years in Kurgan, and he called Ilzarov his second father, and he called <laughs> Kurgan his second homeland, wow. which is really cool. Yeah. I don't have an exact – there's a lot of different numbers that I've seen out there. I don't have an exact number of how many surgeries he underwent. Mm -hmm. But it was probably a couple dozen in total. Uh, when you think about just what he had to go through on this one leg, it's it's, yeah. it's really it's not really sad, but it's it's amazing to think of how it ended too. And mm -hmm. Brummel himself had kind of this bounce backness trait, so to speak. Not only did he recuperate his stride, but he returned to competition. Wow, eking out a leap of six foot nine inches, which you know was not as high as what he once was, but nonetheless still incredible after so much time off. Yeah. <clears throat> and even more interesting, the provider patient relationship lasted well beyond the operating room for the, the surgeon and the smiley Olympian. Il Ilzar was not usually one to be tossed around by the winds of emotions or tickled by camaraderie, but he took a shine to the jumper. Wow. And the two stayed pretty chummy, so to speak, so much so that. Ilzarov served as his best man in Brummel's wedding to an wow. uh, Olympic equestrian. <clears throat> so what better story of pure will and, and drive the, the man who could, you know, jump higher than anybody else in the world. And 
Osama being able to at least restore a lot of that ability with, mm -hmm. with his techniques. So Brummel later turned to the liberal arts after he kind of, you know, finished jumping. And he wrote his own story in Sports Illustrated, like I mentioned already. He wrote an autobiography, many other writing pieces, and he even acted in some movies. Mm -hmm. So pretty luxurious career afterwards. And mm -hmm. later on, what's called the Brummel Gate was installed outside the Ilzarov Center in Kurgan. Patients so cool. can walk under the bar and they see it as a passage to hope and, and recovery. So this was a landmark shift in Ilzarov's career as the world watched Brummel return to sport. <clears throat> and you would thought dissemination of the ring fixer apparatus and technique seemed inevitable, right? Picture a world-renowned athlete being treated today with a newly discovered surgery. The media would eat it up and the surgeon would be adored forever. <clears throat> and actually, this did happen with number one overall pick Alex Smith a few years ago, who was treated with an Ilzarov device. Mm -hmm. But we'll probably discuss that in, in part four. But even after the Brummel miracle, the world still just wasn't ready. So I want to make a, a pit stop for a moment, Victor. <clears throat> the question I received was, Dr. Schrader, can you describe the actual technique Ilzarov was performing? And I kind of want to do that here for you. Mm -hmm. So Ilzarov called his technique bloodless surgery. And while it is not completely bloodless, it is a PG rated version in comparison to many surgeries. I have some modern day pictures here to help explain the technique. Valerie Brummel, many before him and many after him, underwent something along these lines. Of course, there are many varieties and advancements to this technique today, but um, I'll show you a little bit of kind of what goes on here just, just superficially. Mm -hmm. So what was the bread and butter in Ilzarov's cookbook? Well, first, the extremity, uh, as you can see here, sterilized on the operating table, with the assistance of x-rays and feeling for landmarks, the surgeon uses a marker to plan out how the apparatus will sit on mm -hmm. the extremity. Notice how the foot and leg are in neutral alignment during this process. Positioning with this entire technique is, is very important. A sterile frame is pre-constructed to match that extremity mm -hmm. on a different table and then slid over there afterwards. Uh -huh. Sometimes other surgeons will build the frame around the extremity right then and there. Uh, both techniques are, are used today. And then next, you can kind of appreciate there's an electric drill <clears throat> that helps run these wires. We call them, you can call them K wires, or uh, in Russia, they're called spitzes. <laughs> and they run these perpendicular to the extremity and to the rings around there. And they connect them to the rings with nuts and bolts like you can see. Yeah. And what's cool is, I mean, this speaks to the versatility. Multiple rings can be stacked up the extremity. Think of it like scaffolding around a building. That's, yeah. that's essentially what this is. After the, the rings and the wires are put on, uh, a wire tensioner, which you can see up on the top right, <clears throat> kind of takes these, these flimsy wires and it, it stretches them to make them really stiff. Mm -hmm. And this is extremely important so that the frame doesn't shift around on the leg or on the arm. And the wires need to be tensioned to a very precise amount um, and a precise value. And they also need to be thrown at very specific angles. Mm -hmm. And after all this, the frame is now one with the extremity. There afterwards, the Surgeon will <clears throat> kind of plan out where to make uh, one or multiple small incisions. And after doing so, they'll uh, cut through the skin and get down to bone. And then they will stick this chisel or osteotome instrument uh, and navigate it down until it reaches the bone as well. Mm. And the surgeon actually hits the chisel with the hammer or mallet <clears throat> until the hard outer bone is mostly broken. And this is called a corticotomy or sometimes called a shatterotomy because you're literally just shattering the outer bone uh, and you're leaving a lot of the integrity and the medullary bone inside. Mm -hmm. Diagram of this is cross-sectional anatomy of mm -hmm. the lower leg. And we're not going to get specific about too much in it, but you can appreciate the different tissues and bones <clears throat> the surgeon has to be aware of, right? Yeah. The best surgeons are great anatomists and know where their safe zones are. And safe zones are areas where important arteries and nerves and veins are most easily avoided. Mm. 
So there are certain ways that you can throw these, these wires to capture multiple bones or the thickest parts of these bones, all while avoiding the neurovasculature structures. So if I just take, take section A, this is up just underneath the knee here. This mm -hmm. is what, if we look down a, a transverse view, or we look down kind of the, the shaft of the bone, this is what we would see. And uh, really the majority of the nerves or neurovascular structures are right behind it. So you mm -hmm. have a lot of wiggle room and play that you can throw these wires. But if we get down, say, just above the ankle, this is section uh, E here, mm -hmm. uh, you can see a lot of the neurovascular structures uh, are spread out. And also just it's a smaller anatomical area if you think about the, the surface area of a knee versus the surface area of an ankle. Mm -hmm. And you, you have less room for air in throwing some of the wires down here. And, and you can do this with any part of the body. Uh, we talk about the legs a lot, so that's kind of what I've shown. But this is what the surgeons are thinking about as they're passing these, these wires throughout. And all the while, they're getting them to the right tension, the right strength, but also the right angles and making sure they're getting them through the proper parts of the bone. That's so, crazy. Uh, much more complex than that too, but um, superficially, that's kind of what's going on. So okay. uh, over the next several weeks to months, the frame really stays in place. If the goal is to lengthen or shorten, then the turnbuckles are twisted in one direction for compression for say a fracture or in the opposite direction for distraction, such as, as bone lengthening. Mm -hmm. uh, if the goal is to correct certain angles, then the hinges and other modalities are manipulated over time. Actually, I brought some show and tell here that you can appreciate just oh, this wow. is a, a rep. Some of the ones I use, obviously these go around the, the lower leg and, and mm -hmm. the foot. You can attach different struts, different parts to it. But, you That's know, incredible. if you're staring down, if I have a crooked leg and I want to get it, you know, um, back into a rectus or a straight alignment, mm -hmm. if I lengthen these on this side, that's going to help, you know, push the leg into a better position. Or if I mm -hmm. shorten these on this side, that will do the same thing. So right. you can see where I can, I can twist and move different parts around. I can stack rings up. I can do all sorts of things just to, um, maneuver something into the position I want. Here's kind of another variation of it. Oh, wow. Um, the similar concept, different parts. Um, I mean, like I said, it's, it's like an adult playing with uh, Lincoln logs or Legos that <laughs> the, the combinations are, are endless. Yeah. I'll say that's awesome, man. That kind of gives you a good idea of just what goes into this process. And it does. I mean, you, I mean, when you think about it, we're looking at you know these surgeons doing a lot from the outside, but then when you take a look at the interior, that like you just showed us the cross sectional anatomy of what's going on. It's incredible to see that you know this is a lot of surgical skill that's going into this, and they got to know what they're doing to avoid those uh, soft tissue structures. That's 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 incredible. Very cool. It, it really is, and there's just certain geometrical and physical properties to mm -hmm. what creates the most stable construct. Cause you want this construct being as strong as it can. Obviously you want it being stronger than the limb. You don't want mm -hmm. it bending anywhere. You don't want it bowing anywhere. You don't want it shifting anywhere. You want to be able to control this limb mm -hmm. strictly with these wires going through the area. Um, it, it's really just so fascinating. And what it. you can do with it is endless. So, so, I want to get into something, uh, something else that we haven't talked about yet. And what happens when a patient has this hunk of scrap metal attached to them for so long? <clears throat> Patients who wore Elizaro's frame heavy around their leg, sort of like a ball and chain, had stellar results, uh, no doubt. But wearing it was not exactly a, a pleasant experience. And you've, mm. you've experienced something kind of like this, Victor. You could probably even talk about it. But sometimes... Yeah stress from the pins tear on the skin, or they could yank the muscles below. Recall the anatomy we just looked at. There's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. And when this metal kisses bone, patients may perceive the vibrations as kind of this curious chorus of, of torture. Yeah. <laughs> and something we call it is, is cage rage, which, which makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> this is not a true medical condition, but it sums up the antsiness and the anxiety uh, the irritation, even the embarrassment that can come with wearing one of these, not to mention the normal pain and disability just from healing the trauma or healing from the surgery on top mm. of all that. 
Uh, and other things like they can't get normal clothes over it or they can't sleep on their sides, different things. I mean, all this just plays into the whole process. And there's a lot going on in one small area of the body. <clears throat> I've personally had patients begging me to take their frame off and <laughs> sometimes I just can't take it anymore. I've had people tell me they think they're going to die with the frame on. And <laughs> sadly enough, in my young career, I've had two patients that have passed with it on for unrelated events. Um, a lot of times the patients I'm putting these on anyway are just very uh, sick in general. Mm. And interesting enough, I, I thought it was kind of a, a a cool little side story. But last month, a woman told me she felt like the cage was becoming part of her. She said well, she was originally very cautious and conscious of it. After about two months of having it on, she kept bumping it into furniture around her house and it hurt badly when she did. And she just couldn't take the process any longer. But I want to discuss the pain that can come um, specifically from having the frame on. And I like the way one veteran wrote of his time in an Ilizarra frame. I'm actually going to uh, use some of, some of his quote. Mm -hmm. uh, while he was in the hospital, he said, the pain management team used to ask me to rate the pain from one to 10. I could only express in terms of musical instruments. There's piccolo pain, which is shrill and piercing, mm. usually from the plastic surgery, meaning this is the manipulation of kind of the, the soft tissues. Then there's double bass pain deep in the bone mm -hmm. when and after a stretch is something on another level entirely. The veteran continues. I've seen people during war with their legs blown off. Where do I fit into that? It's hard to say, but nine, I suppose fucking nine and a half. He says <laughs> either way, you know, very, very painful. So for some, the process can just be very excruciating. Victory. You've had people come on your show who either, had lengthening done in frames or IM rods who can attest to this. And like I said, I know you can attest to just the migraine people speak of in their legs over yeah. this uh, amount of time. And um, yeah, I don't know. You've, you've spoken on, on your channel before, but uh, I, I can't speak from experience, but I hear it's excruciating. Yeah, so, it is. Quinn, you're a hundred percent right. And everything you just said is like, so true. I mean, I could, go back in time and it's just like this uh this guy said is that you get the dull pain uh the very piccolo light pain um the soft tissue pain and i can tell you that it does radiate different you know levels throughout the day depending on what you're doing and like the woman that you said that when you're walking around you don't realize how big the external fixator is until you bump into something or if you're laying in bed and you kind of make a slight jerk and you feel that on your side it's it's incredible of like the different you know effects that it has on your body throughout the day and uh you know, until you get that thing removed, it's you're kind of um, you know susceptible to all these pain, you know forms of pain. So you're 100 percent right. Did you have any cage rage going on? I you, did. did I did have. I had mine on for close to four months because I had a fractured femur. Um, it was from a car accident, meaning I got hit by a car, fractured my femur. They put a monolateral external fixator on my right femur, hold it in place, and I can tell you that it wasn't a full cage. It wasn't a full external uh, ring fixator, but. The fact is, is that, you know, throughout that time, I noticed that a lot of muscle tethering because it was going through that soft tissue into the bone. And I had that deep bone pain when I would like feel it vibrate and just like hit. It was like that stone cold bone pain. And uh, I wanted that thing off. I just wanted to get back to normal life. I was, a, I think, uh, what was I nine or 10 years old? And I just was like, I want to go play with my friends. And I was stuck in the house for literally a quarter of the year. And it just, it kept me captive. So yes, cage rage is a perfect term. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, uh, you know, we, and you and I talk about this all the time. That's what we've been presenting on for three episodes now, but yeah. you almost get disconnected from the people themselves. And even Absolutely. as doctors, we, we get so tunnel vision into what we're doing. Some of us do that you forget that these patients have lives and have mm -hmm. feelings and have pain receptors and all these other things that really do factor into the, to the bigger picture overall. 100%. Well, um, and, but so as a segue into the next part, sometimes these sensations that the nerve miss, um, you know, for sensational pain, so to speak, are actually picked up by the ears. So speaking of woodwind and, string instruments. We're going to stay on this theme of orchestra for, for a minute. When polio struck the famous Russian maestro Dmitry Shostakovich, I mm. think I'm saying that right. Uh, he's a composer. <clears throat> it took, he took Brummel's same flight from Moscow to Kurgan, begging Ilzara for services. 
Shostakovich was in the late stages of the disease and already had both of his frail legs snap under the weight of his body. Mm. And then polio uh, slowly started stealing the motor control from his gifted hands. I put a picture on here for reference, but the muscle bellies in his palms wasted away. Nerve Mm. fibers between his brain and his fingers literally became disoriented, causing the strings of tendons in his fingers to slacken. Mm. And his dexterity, you know, that he used on the piano and whatnot, all that dexterity declined. Yet, even while being virally robbed of bodily control, the musician still managed to compose his 15th symphony in Ilzarov's hospital corridors. All this later is complicated by heart disease and a final surge of lung cancer, but nonetheless, a cool story. Mm-hmm. But he's a pretty famous guy. Up to this point, he'd lived a musically very cherished life. Interesting enough, a song by him was the anthem for the Soviet space program. And a piece of the song, The Motherland Hears, The Motherland Knows, was actually hum by the first man in space. Wow. Who was was Russian, and he hummed it during his landing. So in a way, the song soon became the theme of kind of the whole Soviet space industry. Mm. So nonetheless, a, a very famous man, and his work was very famous. And What's interesting is Shostakovich is a good example of Ilazarov as an all-encompassing healer. And remember that back from episode one, <clears throat> for years, Ilazarov, before he became an orthopedic surgeon, was kind of this comprehensive and universal doctor. Mm-hmm. Sources on this subject specifically recall that the musician never actually received surgery from Ilazarov. In 1970 and 1971, Ilazarov rehabilitated him by conservative non-surgical means almost like a a mental coach so to speak um but what's interesting enough is even with his frail body the musician actually returned to his craft many placed the polystylist shostakovich in the company of litz and chopin and beethoven as one of the greatest classical composers of all time Mm. of course that's out of my league but in what i've read and some interpret his final symphony as an auditorial precipitation of really the ear piercing methodologies used in Ilzarov's hospital. I actually got a part of his last symphony at the end of it. Tell me if you can hear this, Victor. Okay. So wrote one observer, the symphony's coda is likely a musical transliteration of the hum and clatter of hospital machines. The faceless whirring and beeping that are the grim accompaniments of disease, decline, and death in medical institutions, hmm. in which ends in a hospital ward with the percussive rattles and wheezes of those hospital machines. The final sounds of Shostakovich's symphonic canon are impassive, intimate, and empty. Wow. They're among the most spine-tingling and chilling sounds in orchestral music. So I put this on here, and... Listen for yourself, but the melody does hang, I think, a uh, pretty eerie, ruinous weight on the ear. And you can kind of think of it as noise pollution from this little town in Kurgan, frostbitten echoes, so to speak, from an orthopedic El Dorado masqueraded in the backwoods of Siberia. And it's awesome that even through all that, it still finds our ears today through radio dials and, and film soundtracks. Yeah. But it's a very lovely but interesting piece of music. And it's about 45, 50 minutes long. I've, I've listened to it, and it's, wow. it's wonderful. That's so cool. <clears throat> but nonetheless, between his polio and Ilzarov's place, kind of just this very eerie, creepy symphony that, that he created. Yeah. Definitely. I think that that sums it up. I can hear it, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. I can imagine being in a hospital with all these external fixators and people with traumatized legs and limbs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he wasn't just in Kurgan. He was in other hospitals, too, dealing with issues. Mm. But a lot of his time, like I said, in 1771, were spent in Kurgan. And mm. the whole symphony globally is kind of seen as his end-of-life experience, so to speak, within these different hospitals. And so one of the things I promised you, episode three here, is we would talk more about who Dr. Ilzarov was as a person, mm-hmm. the back scenes of his business, how he carried himself and how he conducted his life. And mm-hmm. so I have a little bit of insight in, into some of that I'm going to share. His 
His academic hours were spent in his home office, which was on the fifth floor of his apartment. And he actually lived about two floors down. Mm -hmm. His employees called it the bunker. And Ilzar became so almighty that orthopedic surgeons working under him had to stand in line at the bunker's entrance and wait long periods to discuss the plan for their patients. Not only did like nurses and office staff have to wait their turns during the day, but full grown cram to la cram surgeons, you know, these are notoriously impatient busybodies were at the daily mercy of the chef. And the chef is the nickname they gave Ilzarov. And even his top surgeons had to sometimes request appointments with him. Wow. And to make matters more frustrating, this didn't really guarantee them a time slot either. A quote is out there, he lived on his own clock, which was completely unsynchronized with the rest of his staff. <laughs> <laughs> he got back from the hospital late most nights. And even when he did, he would change clothes and he would retreat to the bunker for further work. Mm. Some nights he'd uh, invite some of his closest colleagues uh, where they would spin carousel projectors, throwing up slides on the wall and they discuss how cases, you know, could have went better or what went wrong. They dissect out x-rays and they talk about research goals. Mm-hmm. And supposedly they could be up doing this until 4 a.m. Wow. Sometimes. So someone who experienced these focus groups, so for lack of a better term, he said, the lamps on the projectors could not withstand such a load and would burn <laughs> out. But people withstood it. Nobody complained. Nobody wanted to be weaker next to such a strong man. And the museum in Kurgan <clears throat> today has saved and recreated his bunker, as you can see in some mm-hmm. of these pictures here. Wow. At the same time, Ilzar was a hard-boiled man and satisfied with wasting anyone's time but his own. And among his totem pole of surgeons piling up underneath his wing, an unspoken sort of feudal hierarchy developed within the walls of his facility. This hierarchy was not necessarily based on tenure or, or skill set, but how often a surgeon showed face. Mm-hmm. Ilzarov had to have intimacy and comfortability with his pupils before he really gained their trust. It took years of him staring down a surgeon with his piercing snow owl eyes between his cap and mask. But as Ilzarov gained repute, uh, getting in front of him was, you know, you could think of it being like a reporter uh, at a busy press conference, it was very tough to get in front of him. And even if one could engage Ilzarov, rarely could one fall into deep conversation with him. Mm-hmm. He only really warmed up to people if he saw them frequently. <clears throat> Eventually, the facility became overwhelmed with patients from across the world. Ilzarov had to allocate the care seekers to different members of his growing team. And while he was held on to the most, he held on to the most complex patients for himself. Between his exhausting days at the hospital, academics in the bunker, and travel lectures, it left him with little time for clinical assessment, and not to mention rounding on all his post-op patients and rehabbing patients. In order to scale his reach, Elzarov had to transition to more of the supervisor role, like I've hinted towards. A tough move for a man who bemoaned really giving up control. And At times, he could have seven patients, Victor, in seven different operating theaters under anesthesia, and he would bounce back and forth between surgeries, authorizing the most critical parts of each case. And just keeping the information, what's going on with each patient, where they're at in the surgery is is pretty incredible to think Mm -hmm. about. And Mm -hmm. even his most private patients, he eventually had to put under the wing of some of his best surgeons because he was so busy. Wow. And yeah, and- even if this meant his, uh, actually, Victor, cut this last. Just okay, cut that. okay, cut that. Okay, so, yeah, I'll cut it. Anyway, yeah. So anyway, uh, even his most private patients had to go to some of his his best surgeons, but <clears throat> they were still required to report some of the pertinent information to their boss uh, as often as they could, even if it meant standing outside the bunker for for several <laughs> hours. But <clears throat> when Eager surgeons joined his team, most expected a traditional style of mentoring, but the chef carried the practice of really self-teaching and self-motivating. And remember, this is really the only way he knew based on the way he was brought up. Mm 
Mm. He had no formal training himself and he really didn't mollycoddle his pupils and he didn't really give them attaboys or slaps on the back, you know, and rather he expected them to learn by quiet observation. A lot of times when, when Ilzarov entered a room, his demeanor would spread kind of like bouillon cubes in hot water and either through fear or respect all in the room had to shelve their pride, uh, shelve, shelve their pride when, when the chef came in. Seasoned Ilozarovian, Ilozar, uh, which is a devotee of the surgeon, recalls the chef's bite. And in a quote, he says, often you may be criticized as stupid and not worthy to be called a surgeon right in front of the patient. He may even say that you ruined his perfect operation. <laughs> so... Yeah, in Ilzarov's egotistic mind, any mistake made sure as hell was was not his doing. <laughs> and for some newcomers, this breakneck environment was not really their cup of tea. Many mm. withdrew from Kurgan not long after moving in, unable to follow a chief, really, that seemed to wake up on the wrong side of the bed every single morning. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah. So uh, yeah, those are have always seemed to be on 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 the wrong waking up on the wrong side of the bed. But for those that did stick around for years and decades and dedicated themselves to this culture, their contributions became rungs on the legacy ladder. Those are could be harsh. He could be derogatory. He could be very uh, intense towards his employees. And he never hesitated to call somebody out for an old mistake. So it was it was a lot of tough love that went around with him. But because of this tough love, his true disciples and their prodigies are not bound to just a single Russian hospital anymore. Today, they are literally dotted throughout the world and carrying his legacy and improving upon it. Uh, in time, Ilzarov turned his underground technique into more of a headline-grabbing performance. And many of his patients, especially those high in the Soviet ranks were funneled to him by communist party members. Mm. Uh, government officials would send him patients, plutocrats, surgeon colleagues, friends of friends would secretly send clients his way when they could. And think about it like this, highly sought out doctors today can be six months, maybe even a year out to see some of their patients. Mm. And most wear this as a badge of honor. <clears throat> Without inside referrals, a member of the general Russian public could wait five to 10 years wow. to see Ilzarov. <laughs> oh my God. Years to see him. That's how, <laughs> that's just how busy he was one man offering something nobody else could. And that's really just, you know, he only had so much time in the day and so much uh, mm. space and, you know, so many, so much resources. <clears throat> Luckily he did end up spreading this on to, to accommodate this, this snowballing volume of patients he needed an additional building, and he built an outpatient surgery center not far from the hospital he'd been working at. Mm -hmm. The entire facility was shaped like a snowflake. Go figure, <laughs> you're, you're in Russia. And he actually did a lot of in-and-out surgery here, uh, and, and in-and-out surgery centers are sort of universal today. We think about going in for a procedure and coming out that same day, but mm -hmm. this was a fresh idea for the time, not done in most parts of the world. And Really, it cut down on costs, it cut down on hospital stays, and it cut down on disability premiums. Mm. He also used this place for some animal trials. He launched instructional courses and conventions that curious doctors could come learn about his principles. Early on, most of his believers were his employees and his patients, but this was all really starting to change. And official reports on his methods impregnated the orthopedic field, but again, his results seemed so far skewed. But business analysts crunched the numbers. When patients with closed fractures and old fractures came through his doors, they left with a five times better chance of avoiding disability than the national average. They left with an eight times better chance if the fractures were open. <clears throat> Just incredible, incredible numbers. So mm -hmm. His methods were really exceeding the metrics of science at this point and reaching the brim of flawlessness. 48 for every 50 patients that were legally incapacitated by trauma returned to the workforce after Ilzarov got his hands on them. Oh my gosh. 48 out of 50. Just That's unheard of. Crazy. He also started consumer advertising campaigns <clears throat> and 
this seems so far fetched as to my knowledge, there's very little like direct to consumer advertising of his apparatus today, despite the fact it's still commonly used. But though the apparatus could be terrifying, he used female models to kind of subdue its barbarity and patients were displayed living these everyday lifestyles kind of in happy go lucky nonchalance, young, old, and, and in between. With this advertising, he tried to show that normal people could live with an alien device. And <laughs> TV shows, newspapers, magazines promoted images like these where the, the characters or the people in them, some of them are living a, a normal life with their frame on. And <clears throat> um, think of it like prosthetics in, in modern day. There's a mm-hmm. huge market for amputee runners, Special Olympic participants, wheelchair mm-hmm. sports, things of that nature many of which are broadcast and advertised across many media platforms. So Ilzarov was trying to promote an active lifestyle, even through a, a crippling disease. From a medical perspective, he was outgrowing his own britches in, in Russia. But given the current Soviet state and the Russian language barrier, he still had virtually no reach past the Iron Curtain countries. And for those of you who might be unfamiliar with what the Iron Curtain countries are, they They represented the divide between the communist nations like Russia and Poland and and the capitalist European countries. And you can kind of appreciate that in the the cartoon picture on the left or uh, the map on the right. So getting past these these communist countries, this wall and out into uh, Europe and and beyond was was really the difficult part. And there's but there were some accounts where the chef kind of did have his name sprinkled around. This is just uh, for fun. I threw it in. This was the first publication, Eastern German newspaper about the Siberian doctor of miracles. Mm. Wow. And this was back from 1974, I believe. Mm. So some, some things did get through, but um, kind of sum up the, the rest of this on one more real good story. It would take a trio of mariners to finally propel Ilazarov's techniques out of Russia. And the first segment of this triangle was the Norwegian adventure Thor Heyerdahl. This guy had already made a name for himself with his world-famous expeditions. In 1947, this man without fear <clears throat> set out on a 101-day nautical voyage riding east to west ocean currents from South America to the Polynesian Islands. Uh, and he made landfall in a raft weaved from light woods, bamboo stalks, and banana leaf thatching. <clears throat> Heyerdahl made a convincing argument with this voyage that ancient Americans helped settle Eastern Polynesia despite very, very primitive seabaring equipment or food rations. Heyerdahl grew even more cavalier in 1969 and then again in 1970. He pieced together papyrus vessels. <clears throat> These were called the Ra 1 and Ra 2 missions. And this time, this was inspired by ancient Egyptian blueprints. <clears throat> Uh, In it, he and a seaworthy six-man crew tried to cross the Atlantic Ocean. He mustered up a relentless group of a miscellany of nationalities, Egyptian, American, Mexican, Chadian, Italian, and Russian. But the papyrus boat swelled with water and kind of lost its buoyancy a week before reaching its final destination. You can actually see that here on the first rock edition before they could oh. reach their destination. Mm-hmm. So a year later, Heyerdahl assembled a crew of seven men. And uh, again, from all different nations, <clears throat> uh, some of them being the same men from the previous trip. And he intended to demonstrate how, again, a manifold group of individuals could cooperate and effectively under stressful conditions, uh, complete the voyage. One of these crew members was the Italian Carlo Mari, and he's, he's number two in this group. He was an alpinist by trade, Um, but in doing so, at some point, he suffered a compound fracture of his tibia during a high-impact snow skiing tragedy. The shards broke through the skin and bacteria invaded the bony cavity. Hmm. And when he was put back together, he still had this chronic deep-seating infection and a permanent deformity. Hmm. So for every adventure he took, he usually needed some sort of orthopedic bracing just to quasi-study his lopsided gait. These are some pictures of young Carlo Mari here. Mm-hmm. 
And during the two raw escapades, the Italian, Carl Amari, like we just spoke about, got to know his Russian matey and pulmonologist, Yuri Sinkovich, hmm. who's the third part of this trio, hmm. and the appointed physician for the trip. You can see him over here on the right. Yeah. Um, and the two kind of bookend this 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 whole group here, which is fun. Thor Heyerdahl is there in the middle of the trip lead um, <clears throat> with the blue arrow. But so between salt water baths and probably some some meals at Chung, these two men on the end actually got to know each other better than most. Mm. And on the boat's uneven surface, it didn't take long for Doctor Sinkovich to notice that Mari kind of had this pirate's limp to him. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Mari waddled rigidly. He'd place weight uh, on the side of his foot as it curled and, and uh, his, his calf contracted. Mm -hmm. And his posture was probably challenged by each ambushing wave. But after these two Atlantic escapades, the three men all kind of went their separate ways. And in particular, Sinkovich, he was the doctor, soared into Russian television limelight. And he added to his very colorful resume they already had of Explorer, and he was a cosmonaut examiner and a military doctor. And he then became the anchor man for a tourism talk show called Travelers Club. I think mm -hmm. it went on for about three decades, and he kind of ran the, the commercial cockpit of that, became very well known for it. Mm -hmm. And he made connections across Russia <clears throat> and kind of received this VIP access to some of the Soviet's most elite. And... Millions of citizens followed his show. A-listers from around the world welcomed him, cinematographers and free divers and conservationists, and even the man that invented scuba gear. Uh, he just met and brought in a lot of very famous, brilliant, innovative people. And he was loved inside and outside of the motherland. <clears throat> and years later, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin actually thanked the late Sankovich for his far-reaching influence as part of his 2003 obituary. Wow. Mm. But so during Sinkovich's early tenure in this new anchorman position, he was introduced to Ilzarov and seeing how the surgeon rehabilitated people with joint dislocations or fractures or polio and much more. He remembered his Italian shipmate, Carlo Mari, whose, you know, uneven legs quivered under the rocking tide of that papyrus lifeboat. But he wouldn't see his friend for another seven years, yeah. funny enough, when they both agreed to join Captain Hyerdahl on another voyage in 1977. I mean, these guys are just relentless thrill seekers. <laughs> <laughs> and this time, the raft was named Tigris. It was yes. built from cross-hatched reeds and, uh, reeds. and this time, they cut through the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. You can kind of see this on the map there, around mm -hmm. the Arabian Peninsula. And they did this to validate some ancient trade routes that uh, uh, hired all wanted, wanted to prove. So <clears throat> on this trip specifically, the scar tissue in Mari's leg reopened mm -hmm. and the bone that had long been hovering just under the skin finally broke through. But five months into the voyage, <clears throat> the crew actually made a bold statement and elected to burn their own boat and protest against some of the war and violence going on within the region. Mm. And burning the boat was kind of a statement made to the world in peril. Um, but before burning the boat, Sinkovich revealed to Carl Amari a possible remedy for his leg. And while the eyes of the world had been on their mission on, on the boat, Sinkovich was sending Mari to an unknown world in Kurgan, Russia. <laughs> so... Of course, Kurgan was a less than luxurious city, but Mari was very used to living and living with minimal luxuries. And still, Ilzar was confident that he could attach a cage around Mari's leg and restore it to its pre-injury form. Mm. So this Ilzar of Mari introduction, you can see the two here, mm -hmm. which was mediated by Dr. Sinkovich in 1980, would become the pivotal moment. And when I say the pivotal moment, this is the pivotal moment for the exodus of Ilzarov's techniques out of Russia and into the Western nations. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the two are shown here walking in Kurgan Square. Wow. And this has to be one of my favorite pictures of all. Uh, I'll explain it here. But mm -hmm. in April of 1980, and recall, this is about three decades now since Ilzarov had invented his apparatus. After temporarily paralyzing Mari's legs with a bolus of spinal anesthesia, 
he retrofit his apparatus onto Mari's right shin. Mari may have been numb to the waist, but he had heard every rotation of the drill, every strike of the hammer, and every bull whipping crack of the metal piercing his bone. Hmm. <clears throat> and at the conclusion, <laughs> Mari sat up and shared a celebratory cigarette with his surgeon right <laughs> on the operating day. Uh, just so you know, such practices have since been outlawed, if, if anybody was wondering. But Elzarov uh, basically shimmied down his loose-fitting mask and took a puff as well. And In fact, he was infamous for smoking in the operating room, as he was too stubborn and really work-whipped to take breaks. And sometimes ashes would actually drop on the operating table. <clears throat> and his answer was, embers are sterile. <laughs> he would find the surgical staff of that and nobody really questioned the chef. So yeah, you can see in the picture here, the apparatus bit into Mari's leg, almost like the world's largest leech. And it shared a cot with him for the next several months while Ilzarov's team used it to reposition his anatomy so that the leg no longer curled underneath his body. And at the same time, he actually also lengthened him about two centimeters and restored him with a matching pair Mm. Uh, you can see the picture on, on the far right walking after yeah. or during the operation. So Mari became one of the earliest non-Soviet patients of Ilzarov's, and it took nearly three decades for an outsider to experience the doctor's Siberian sorcery. <laughs> so back in his hometown of Lecco, Italy, uh, Mari walked unassisted into his physician's offices with a near wow. normal gait. To their disbelief, right? And mm -hmm. Mari also took out a newspaper ad hailing Dr. Ilzarov as the Michelangelo of orthopedics That's and so cool. detailed his, his brilliant experience. And the Italian surgeons then asked Mari to invite this miracle worker to speak at the highly attended AO conference in Bellagio, Italy, mm -hmm. not long after. And this is where some of the country's best orthopedic surgeons would be coalescing. And so coming up in part four, Victor, it's going to be the finale of our four-part series. We wow. talk about Lazaro's introduction to these Italian surgeons uh, via Mari, who helps mediate it, and how you know he's finally now getting the appreciation throughout the world and starting to train other disciples, and many other people are starting to learn just the brilliance of his technique. Mm -hmm. We talk about his final years. <clears throat> kind of how his life came to an end. Uh, we talk a long time about what kind of legacy he left for the world and also how his technique has evolved, which is a lot of what you talk on your show mm -hmm. on the different ways people are not only getting limb lengthening, but deformity corrections in general. So we'll discuss how his method and the scrap metal that he used originally back in the early 1950s, where that has now come into the 2020s and where it's going to go beyond. Oh so uh, a lot of references that have accumulated up over the uh, last several episodes, but mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot of research on the subject. I've done about as much research as I can. So uh, <laughs> we're going to dive into any of these if you're interested and uh, always happy to answer any questions um <clears throat> that anybody would have or they're welcome to email me um so yeah love the subject like i said i can't i can't put into words how incredible this guy was and he's become mm -hmm. kind of a hero i've learned about him and <clears throat> you know i think it comes down to what people like you mm -hmm. have had how your life has changed uh from traumatic events to to being able to walk normally again or move normally again or perform activities of daily living with ease and Absolutely. i i can't sit here and attest any of that but mm -hmm. many people out there can i think you do a good job of bringing those type of people on your show that was an incredible discussion quinn i mean going up from Elizaroff, uh, more in depth as a man, as a surgeon, his demeanor, his personality. Um, then talking about, you know, uh, uh, Valerie Brumel to Shostakovich to Heyerdahl to Sinkov Dr. Sinkovich to Mari, and, and then how it's going to bring to the Italians and how Elizaroff's going to get all of his, you know, well known recognition for his invention. It's going to be incredible. I mean, you've done fantastic work on this. I mean, seriously, the novelist, <laughs> Dr. Quinn Schrader, everybody, you got to give it up for this guy. He's incredible i mean seriously this is going to have all of the parts that you need to know about the history of limb lengthening the history of ilizarov there's nothing better on the internet that you can find so 
definitely reach out to Quinn if you want to, you know, be a part of his novel, um, or if you just want to ask him questions, maybe ask questions for the following episode we have coming up in part four. And uh, Quinn, I just can't say anything, but thank you, man. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing all this amazing information. Yeah. It's been great. great so, you know, I enjoy it. We'll uh, we'll get number four out there soon. So it'll be fun. What a jam packed episode! From learning about Dr. Lizarov as a stern yet genius surgeon who loved his craft and his one of a kind invention, to meeting famous figures like Mari and Brumel, who were the pivotal moment in his claim to fame. It goes without saying that Dr. Lizarov's legacy is becoming one for the ages. And that's exactly what episode four is gonna be about, the teachings and techniques that Dr. Lizarov passes on to his successors that transcend time and impact the future of limb lengthening. So thanks again for watching episode three of the history of Lizarov, and stay tuned for episode four, the finale in our four-part series. Until next time, this is Victor from Cyborg for Life, signing out.